Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to see all of you here in Missouri Auditorium. Special welcome to those who are watching this by video, who are working hard at their benches or in clinic spaces on the NIH campus, but also special welcome to the many who are watching on Facebook Live, because we are streaming this in a live format so the whole world uh, can hear the conversation we're going to be having uh, with a distinguished author about a very interesting book. I'll come to that in a moment. Let me just remind all of you about the Big Read, which we're here for the third annual gathering uh, to talk about. This was proposed by the NIH Library as a means of trying to bring together our scientific community uh, to talk about an interesting book that had in implications for biomedical research. And so it's always been interesting to try to see which books would be chosen for that purpose. And I think we've had a very good run here uh, for our first three years, including today. Uh, the first big read in 2017, our author was Sid Mukherjee, and the book was his remarkable tome called The Gene, An Intimate History, uh, focusing on an in-depth look at the history of genetics and where it has come and where it's going. Last year, the second big read was held featuring the book, I Contain Multitudes, The Microbes Within Us, and a Grander View of Life. And the author was Ed Young, exploring the world of microbio mi microbes in a very interesting exchange that we had. But today, we are moving into neuroscience. Our big read book is unthinkable. Some of you, I hope, have seen it because many of you have read it. An Extraordinary Journey Through the World's Strangest Brains uh, by Helen Thompson, taking a fascinating journey through the human mind by way of nine chapters describing extraordinary people with rare neurological conditions. Now, the program began, uh, the Big Read did, with several book discussions that were held in April, May, and June at the NIH Library and by groups of NIH staff holding independent discussions. I gather some of them in some of our outlying facilities. Uh, I was just told there was one at the Rocky Mountain Labs in Montana, all bringing us together uh, to have a conversation about this book. And now today, uh, we bring all of those ideas and questions that have been submitted uh, that I will have a chance to pose to the author uh, here so that we can try to learn everything we can uh, and from this particular experience of digging deeply into a piece of literature that also has wonderful insights uh, into a kind of science that we're very much invested in right now, the science of the human brain. With that, let me now introduce uh, the author. In a minute, I'll ask her to come out and we'll take our spaces there, but let me tell you a brief word about Helen Thompson. She's a freelance science journalist and an author. She's worked at New Scientist as a consultant and writes a blog about sex and gender for Forbes. Her work has been published in many different outlets, New Scientist, Nature, The Telegraph, The Guardian, The BBC, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, The Daily Mail, and more. For eight years, she was editor and reporter at New Scientist. Some of the things that she wrote about was having coffee with five psychopathic mass murderers. Okay, uh, I assume there was security in the room. Uh, she interviewed a man who thought he was dead. I think we'll hear about that. That's in this book. She revealed the plans. She was, had the exclusive on this for something that uh, happily didn't happen yet, but it was proposed, the world's first head transplant. Uh, she learned how to win roulette uh, by uh, basically understanding the rules of that, scrubbed up for various operations, uh, watched a paralyzed man walk for the first time using a mind-controlled exoskeleton. She's been honored for her work, receiving the Best Staff Journalist at the Medical Journalist Association Award in 2015. That was for her articles on sequencing of newborn babies, the experimental use of blood transfusions to combat dementia, and again, the human head transplant uh, potential. Uh, she has had other awards, including uh, Best Newcomer at the Association for British Science Writers in 2010. Her background is a bachelor's in science and neuroscience and a master's degree in science communication. And her focus has particularly been about the brain with that background, but interested in all aspects of that. Uh, you can find a lot more about her on the web, but right now, you don't get to go to the web and read about her. You get to hear from her directly as we move into the interview part of the Big Read. Please join me in welcoming author Helen Thompson. Please. 
So Helen, welcome uh, to the Thank National Institutes me. of Health. All of these folks are delighted to have a chance to hear from you. Now, many of them have read your words and now they get to hear a little bit more about the background of all this. And so maybe I should start off giving you a chance uh, to say something about how you came to write this book. What got you interested? Um, so I, as you mentioned, had um, a did a master's in science communication and ended up working at New Scientist magazine. And um, I just loved writing about the brain. I learned about it at university and just loved, loved exploring it um, as a journalist. And um, every now and then I would just come across these case studies that were published in, in uh, journals. And they were just really extraordinary. They just really stood out to me. Um, and I would talk to the neurologists behind the case studies and learn, learn about these strange conditions. And I just, over time, grew this kind of pile on my desk um, mm. of, I just kept them separately. And um, it was actually uh, one particular case study who a neurologist said, would you like to speak to this person? Um, and I think you'd find him very interesting. And on paper, he had had a stroke, so it wasn't particularly uh, uncommon or extraordinary on paper, but in person, this guy was um, somebody called Tommy McHugh. He's Tommy. And um, recognized that uh, he, yeah, I mean, he basically <laughs> his story in a, in a in a nutshell was he was a self-confessed wrongen. He had been in jail. He had um, had a very aggressive tendencies. He was had drug problems, including heroin. He'd had his children taken away from him. He had been taught to always suppress his emotions. Um, and basically, he had a stroke, and he had a completely different personality when he woke up. Uh, he was unrecognizable. He felt emotions that he'd never experienced before. He saw numbers in trees. He, uh, he spoke in rhyme almost all of the time. He, um, he had no, he couldn't, his doctors who knew him before and after described him as like a monk sweeping the steps in front of him so not to harm a fly. Um, and so I, I ended up talking to this, to this guy and I just thought, wow, you would never have known what your brain was capable of on paper if you just read the journal article. Um, and you, uh, I just thought, well, who else has got these amazing stories out there? And, 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 um, and so I went back through this pile of, of, of people, case studies, and um, huh. sort, of, sort of tried to see, well, who, who might want to speak to me and who might want to tell me their stories. So Tommy started this idea, and again, this chapter about Tommy is particularly compelling, this dramatic personality change after this uh, stroke, as you've just described. Now, other people have written books about the brain, and particularly about situations where the brain behaves in unexpected ways. Most of us are familiar with the work of Oliver Sacks, uh, who certainly wrote books of this sort that were quite compelling. But you've done this a bit differently in terms of really spending time with these individuals, mm. which must have made it a tougher book to write in terms of the time commitment, traveling all over the place. Why did you decide to do it that way instead of just you know writing up their clinical stories and saying, I'm done? Um, I mean, I was a big fan of Oliver Sacks and had read all his books. Um, I did wonder, part of it was that he, you know, the man who mistook his wife for a hat happened in, I think it was almost 30, 30 40 years ago, and I wondered, you know, neuroscience has come along so f much since then uh, mm -hmm. that I wondered, well, what do we know now that we didn't know then, and yeah. what kind of conditions do we know about now that he, you know, he wouldn't have known about? Um, so that was part of it, and the other part of, of visiting these people is, is that I'm not, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a doctor, so I didn't, um, I didn't want to approach these people from a clinical perspective in terms of seeing what they were like in a hospital environment. I wanted to very specifically go and meet them in their towns, in their homes, and see who they were as a person, because I think that's the, you know, we can learn about the brain, but the brain creates us and who we are as a people, and that's, that's the most interesting part to me of mm -hmm. learning about the brain, is actually learning about what it creates, which is, which is the person. Um, and I felt that that best way to do that was to get to know them and actually see how people with strange, extraordinary brains and brain conditions actually live their life and how it affects them on a day-to-day -day basis. Because actually one of, the, one of the, the, uh, the, the highlights before I started this kind of whole journey was speaking to somebody with face blindness. And I remember um, I was talking to her just from a, um, I was writing a story about uh, face blindness and she happened to mention to me about a time when she was uh, 16, 17 and she'd gone on a date and she'd 
gone to the bathroom um, halfway through the day and she'd come back to the restaurant and she couldn't remember where she was sitting and she couldn't recognise the person that she was mm. on a date with. Awkward. And um, <clears throat> she said that she went and sat down at the wrong table. And um, I just thought it was that it was what, that story that really stuck in my mind that I thought it's not the kind of thing you would find out about in a, in a doctor's office when somebody is talking to their patient. You know, it's the kind right. of thing that you find out about when you're talking to somebody as a friend or, you know, in the pub. And I thought those are the kinds of stories that really mm -hmm. make the brain, put the brain disorder into, into context. And um, I just thought it was a really nice way of, of learning about it. In at least one situation, uh, that willingness to find out what it's like uh, for the person in their natural environment maybe puts you at a little bit of physical risk. Uh, at least it sounded that way from the way you wrote that chapter. So say something about that. Did you ever feel like, boy, maybe this is not the smartest thing to be out here doing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess you're referring to the, the medical lycanthropy. So this was a condition, um, yes. if you haven't read the book, it's, it's, um, it's something that we see in Harry Potter and uh, in the Twilight Saga, um, it, but it's a real life condition. It's the thought that you, it's a delusion of turning into an animal and it can be any animal. Um, there's been people who thought they were bees, snakes, hyenas. Um, and this particular guy um, had the delusion of turning into a tiger. And he had been well for three years. And when I was invited by his doctors, um, who I knew previously from having spoken to them about uh, other research they'd done, um, and they said, we've got this patient and we've talked to him and he'd love to tell you his story. Would you like to come to Abu Dhabi and, and speak to him? And I jumped at the chance because you, medical lycanthropy is so, so rare. So um, thankfully. And um, so I, yeah, I went to Abu Dhabi. I, I, I met him actually at the hospital um, because it was the most convenient place for us to all meet with his doctors. And unbeknownst to all of us, to kind of cut a long story short, he had stopped taking his medication uh, within the last sort of three or four days beforehand. And in the middle of our interview, started to have the delusion. Um, and we and were to snarl and growl. yeah. So we were sitting closer than you and I. And we were he was sort of sitting about mm -hmm. there. Um, and he just stopped at one point and he just started to um, sort of his hands came out like this and just started to make these kind of claw uh, sort of shapes and then he's just started to snarl and um, and then the snarls and the kind of grasping kind of started pointing towards us and um, it sounds it's very hard to explain because it sounds like somebody it wasn't like an actor acting like a tiger. It was, there was this real internal battle. You could see that he was tr really struggling to contain this delusion that was part of his mind was in this room with us and part of his mind was, you know, turning into a tiger. And it was, yeah, it was, that was quite um, a disturbing experience for everybody obviously involved. It sounded like it. Yeah. You wrote in these nine chapters about more than nine cases, because many times in a chapter describing a particular kind of brain function, you weave in two or three stories. But were there a lot of other stories that didn't make the cut? Um, I wish I could say I had this grand plan of specific people, <laughs> but I, I did. Um, <clears throat> I, I had maybe three other people that I would have liked to have spoken mm -hmm. to um, originally. One of them was a face blindness, but when I pitched the book, uh, I think Brad Pitt came out and said that he had face blindness, and so the publishers said, "Oh, that's way too common. You can't use that one anymore." Like, if Brad Pitt's got it, then you know we don't want to hear about it. So um, we dumped that one. I would have and thought it would go the other way, but you know. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm not selling books. It was yeah too common for them after that. Um, and then there was a guy who I had previously spoken to, who I wanted to visit, who had the condition. It's gone through various names. I'm not sure what the most common name for it is now, but it's um, where you, you reject your limbs. Um, mm. And he had rejected, he tried to break his back um, in order to get his legs amputated because he felt that they weren't part of his body. Um, and he was, he was well, and then when we came to do the book, uh, the, to, to have an interview, he um, decided that he, he just wasn't, he wasn't well enough again. He was still in the midst of this um, condition. And I really wanted to focus on people who um, had recovered or were able to, um, you know, really were, had come to terms with their condition. So mm -hmm. um, he wasn't somebody that, yeah, I would have liked to have spoken to, but, but didn't. 
So lots of neuroscientists in the room and listening to this, and as we read a book like yours, you do get into the neuroanatomy about a particular part of the brain that seemed by some studies to be involved in some of these behaviors. I'm curious because the people you were speaking with went through those kinds of studies, and I assume also were told, oh, well, maybe this is happening because your habenula is out of whack or, or some such thing. How did they interpret the experience of having their neurological circumstance uh, reduced in a certain way uh, to images that said, well, your brain is a little different than the average mm -hmm. person. Was that something that was actually a relief to them? Um, how, did they, how did they respond to the data? Yeah, I mean, absolutely a relief. And I think most people, um, <clears throat> I mean, this is a fundamental problem is that we don't compare our own mental landscapes with other people. We don't tend to consider our own mental landscapes. We don't tend to think, or at least we don't definitely don't compare them to other people's and it's very hard to do. And so when it goes wrong or something feels unusual, you know, the immediate thought is that, well, we've got a brain tumor or we've got something, you know, desperately, desperately wrong with us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it is a, definitely a relief to find out that actually we can pinpoint this particular problem between this and this area and you know there's a reason for but I mean part of their recovery for some of these people was just finding out exactly what part of the brain was wrong um, for some people it really didn't matter um, I remember talking to Graham who had the deluge Cotard's delusion which was the belief that he had died and he you know he just really couldn't he didn't, couldn't care less about what was going on in his brain all he wanted was to um, was it for it to be better um, and mm. he never really understood what had gone wrong with him um, or his brain and he you know he saw this brain scan that we all thought was unbelievable because um, he, his brain looked like somebody who's was in a coma um, so it had such low activity uh -huh. when he was um, up about and, and walking around that it, you know some of the world's leading neurologists said if you showed me this brain scan I would think that you were showing me somebody who was unconscious or or asleep or in a coma um, and, you know, for me, as somebody who's interested in the brain, and, you know, I think, wow, how can you have a brain scan that looks like that? And you've got somebody up and walking around. Um, but for him, he was just, you know, he didn't, he'd never seen a brain scan before. It didn't mean anything to him. Um, so, yeah, there was, a, there was different differences. One of the things the folks in the book clubs noted, and I, I confess this happened to me as well, uh, reading through the book, you seem to know people who have a more minor version of some of the things that you describe, maybe even oneself. So I wonder how you sort of perceive that. You, you write about people who are able to get lost in their own house because they have the sense of direction that's just not there. Uh, I guess that was, uh, um, I can't remember which patient that was, a very interesting sure. sort of example. And we all have been in cars with people who have that problem and sometimes <laughs> ended up in a very different place than we expected. Uh, <laughs> You talk about uh, people who have this remarkable memory uh, to be able to recall the details of things that happened many years earlier, right down to the level of precision that most of us would not have. I think I know at least one person who has some of that uh, capabilities, works in building one. Uh, you talk about Sylvia, who has musical hallucinations where there is a orchestra running all the time, and uh, that's me, I mean, that is, uh, this was like, okay, maybe I need wow. to be a case in your book. Cause, <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm supposed to be uh, doing a song tomorrow at a memorial service that I didn't know before, so I've had to learn it. And it gets into your head. Some people call it an earworm. Even to the point where I wake up in the middle of the night and I realize it's been playing the whole time I've been asleep because wow. it's still there. So what, how do you view this sort of spectrum? Yeah. You obviously pick people who are way out on the edge of it. Yeah. But it almost seems as if by reading the book that it is a spectrum and maybe there is not a clear dividing line between the people you wrote about and mm. the rest of us. They just have a more extreme version of something that's mm. part of many human personalities. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what I, I realized towards the end of the book was that none of these people 
although I picked them for their extraordinary brains, actually none of them existed completely uniquely on its own. Uh, it, they, were all, they all had extreme versions of traits that we all possess and that we all just sit on this spectrum. And like you say, everybody knows somebody who mm. you know, can't find their way out of a paper bag, as you know, the phrase goes. And, 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 we, and maybe Sharon was at this end of that, but uh, we all sort of can place ourselves somewhere along that spectrum. And, and um, you know, there was one of the patients was uh, Joel, who could feel other people's pain as, and touch as if it's happening to his own body. Uh, and we can again, you know, that sounds so dramatic, but actually we can all place ourselves on a spectrum of, of empathy. And I found, um, like you said, you know, you start to think, well, what, you know, I've got a little bit of that. I, and I, I, I can't watch um, horror films, and I can never, I've never been able to understand people who can, who, how people can watch horror, and because I feel such a a sort of visceral gut reaction to seeing any kind of pain on, on TV that I, I wondered then, having spoken to Joel, whether I sat, you know, just slightly further up the spectrum than, than, mm. than, than normal. Um, and, yeah, I think for all of these cases and all of these traits, you can just place yourself somewhere on it, and it, that's why everybody can feel a little bit of themselves or know somebody who is more this way or that way on, on, on each, for each trait. You mentioned Joe in this uh, remarkable story because Joe was a physician but had this empathy taken to an extreme, <clears throat> even to the point of being able to physically feel touch from somebody who's talking to who's being touched in some way and certainly having the emotional response. And you talk about how that is a function of the mirror neurons, which I didn't know much about until this uh, uh, description. We are going to develop, and we're in the middle of doing that, um, methods that will allow us at much greater level of precision to identify what's really going on in the brain in real time and how we're all different. I wore my brain tie today just to be <laughs> sure I was prepared for this. So <clears throat> obviously this is a simple matter of a large scale view uh, of a brain with an fMRI or a PET scan. But as we get better and better with the brain initiative, which aims to actually develop and then apply the technologies that can in real time see how circuits of millions of neurons are functioning. Mm. This kind of individual, like Joe, uh, is going to be an interesting subject mm. to try to sort this out and maybe provide all of us with opportunities to learn more about our endowment of capabilities than we otherwise would have guessed. That might make for a different book in a few years mm. where the neuroanatomic and neurophysiological basis of all this becomes even more clear. Uh, are, are you thinking, I mean, you, you mentioned a little bit ago about how Oliver Sacks' observations, many of them from 30, 40 years ago, were a different kind of view than what you're doing mm. now. What would this kind of book look like 10 years from now or 20 years from now? Yeah, I mean, that's a really well, hard, you write it. hard question to <laughs> answer. Um, <clears throat> I am really interested in the biotechnology sort of side of things at the moment and um, how we are able to use brain non-invasive brain stimulation to recreate certain mental faculties, mental okay. traits, um, and how we're now combining that with, I think they've just started being able to stimulate and record from the brain at the same time. Uh, so it's overcome that kind of technical hurdle and that I think would be very interesting to see um, to be able to kind of manipulate and record from the brain um, as somebody's walking around. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, all these, these kind of technologies of biotech is, is, I think, fascinating. It will definitely start to reveal what's go on, going on behind, um, behind some of these, these problems and, and also help us perhaps in other ways boost normal cognition as well. You know, it may be help us with our attention, with our math solving problem, but, you know, it, whatever it is, I think there's um, your, your world's your oyster once you start being able to manipulate these things. Indeed, although we all worry about exactly where that could be taken yeah. in terms of the less ethical applications. Do you want to have somebody else's memories implanted in your brain? Well, maybe we'll figure out how to do that and maybe yeah. we'll need to think very carefully about when that's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, Helen, let me go back a little bit uh, and ask you a bit more about your career because I think people who are here are always curious to know how somebody ends up being a very effective uh, science journalist. How did you end up in that particular pathway? Was it the science that came first, the communication that came first, neither of the above? 
Um, yeah, so I, so I did a neuroscience degree and I really loved all the different aspects of it, but I didn't love the research project at the end because it was too narrow for me because I felt that this wasn't something that I wanted to constant. I didn't want to pick, basically. I, <laughs> there was too many things that I, I was interested in, in. And so that definitely came first, an interest in the brain. And then uh, in the UK, we have a really great master's at Imperial College um, that is science communication. So mm. we got to uh, spend time learning how to make documentaries, science documentaries, um, how to curate museum exhibitions, um, how to do radio, print, um, so various uh, ways, different ways of communicating science, and um, that was just amazing. It was just really uh, gave me a you know great insight into all the different uh, techniques that you can use to translate mm -hmm. science to a lay audience. And um, I just I really loved the print um, aspect of it. And um, luckily, we got given some amazing internship opportunities there. Um, so I went to work at CERN for six months, and I also then went to New Scientist as an intern at, at twenty. 21 and um, uh, then just nev never left <laughs> really um, and yeah I've been there sort of on and off ever since. And did you know somewhere along the way that eventually you wanted to write books and not just write blogs and essays? No I um, can't say that I had a grand plan for it but I um, <laughs> I wrote a blog it, it ended it started with a blog for New Scientist I started talking to these people over the phone um, and I had 700 words to, to explain their story and I just thought, you know, I, they, they've got so many extraordinary stories, I want to tell more of them and I want to go and meet them in person and actually see them in their day-to-day -day lives and, and that's where the book kind of came from, this, this blog um, uh, that was essentially tiny little bits of each chapter. And for you, is writing a book a joy or is it a trial? <laughs> um, well, I think I had a 10-month deadline to do it, and it took me three and a half years, so <laughs> make of that what you will. Um, That's about average, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was definitely harder than I, than I expected, but no, it was very, really enjoyable. And it's really nice to be able to really dig deep into a subject and, and take your time to actually explore all these things rather than having a, a daily, hourly deadline that you normally have as, as a journalist. So, yeah, it was very enjoyable. So there's a question from Facebook. Uh, what would you say are the top three most personally influential pieces of literature that you have read? What, what books influenced you, whether they're about yeah, science wow. or medicine or not, uh, to want to be a writer if they did? Uh, <clears throat> I, mean, I, I mean, I've mentioned Oliver Sacks before, but I used his books to get into university. I wrote my um, essay to get onto my degree um, about Oliver Sacks, and he was, I think, <clears throat> really the only person who or a piece of literature that really made me want to be a writer or a journalist. Um, he, I actually got to interview him um, once during my career, which was, which was just like, it was just the best conversation I've ever had with anyone. Oh gosh, nice. um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, he, he, he speaks like he writes. And um, uh, yeah, that was amazing. So I would say just, I really, he's the only person I can really pick out that was really influential in that way. Did you influence your own sort of um, daily experience by the things that happened that you learned about in the course of talking to all these people in your nine chapters? So for instance, you, in the chapter about the person with the extraordinary memory, you actually get into how it is that people can train themselves uh, to memorize an entire 52-card uh, deck and get it in the right order. And you talk about this thing called the mind palace do you use that now to uh, kind of win at cards or anything else? <laughs> no, I would love to. Um, no, I don't, I don't use the Mind Palace. I think I'm like everybody else. You know, I, I use lists um, on my phone, you know, I, when you could use your memory. But um, I do, I was actually talking at lunch with some, some researchers and uh, saying that actually one of the tricks that I learned was talking to Sharon, who you mentioned earlier, has the inability to form a mental map and gets lost in her own home. Um, and right. she's, she's permanently lost. And, and in studying her, researchers discovered that there were areas of the brain um, that were primarily responsible for um, identifying permanent landmarks and that that's a very important job when you're creating your mental map of your environment. Um, and people who have lesions in that area, they won't, you can take them to the center of London and say, 
choose me a permanent landmark that will help you get back to this spot. And they'll be just as likely to choose a passing car as they will Big Ben. So um, it just, they cannot identify these, these permanent landmarks hmm. without this part of the brain working properly. And um, so they realize that actually when you're in a new place, if you look um, around you and really concentrate on and pick out these permanent landmarks around you, you'll be able to create a mental map of that uh, environment when you come back if you're trying to find your way home or you're walking around a new city and that I, f I use all of the time and I think I find it so <laughs> useful um, and the other trick was um, it's something that animals do which is to look behind them when they're in a new place um, to see what it looks like on the on and they With use it headed back. yeah they use it to <coughs> find their way home and it's just not something i don't think anybody ever does naturally but if you start doing it you'll realize how useful it is when you when you're in a new place so i don't use the mind palace technique but i do use some of them some of the other ones it's interesting there was an op-ed in the washington post earlier this week and then i heard a story uh, on the same lines on npr yesterday <laughs> about GPS and how it is that so many people are losing their navigation skills because they depend on the GPS to tell you where yeah. you are and where to turn yeah. and that that could be a really bad thing. And of course, underlying all of this is the conclusion that it's not just the navigation skills you're born with, it's how you've actually trained them mm. and used them and developed them into a place where they could be better. I guess when you see people with these particular kinds of brain difficulties, presumably that's not entirely genetic endowment. Some of it might also be environmental influence, and we should pay attention. Yeah, I think the people in the book are probably, uh, well, obviously they're extreme cases, and so there are very specific reasons that are either genetic or oh. a lesion or, or something. Um, but yeah, like we said, of spectrum, I'm sure there is environmental influences that can place you, can push you in one direction or the other. Um, one of the things they've recently found from Sharon uh, with the uh, inability to create this mental map is that it is genetic. And um, they've, they've found it runs in families. And so now they're actually looking, um, and part of, part of Sharon's problems were that when she was young, she told her mum about it and her mum said, don't ever, she was a five-year-old and she told her mum that she you know, didn't know where she was, and nothing looked familiar. Um, and her mum said, don't ever tell anybody about this because they'll think you're a witch and they'll burn you. And she, was, which was the reason that Sharon then didn't tell anybody about this condition until she was in her 30s. Um, and it, you know, now thinking back, she realizes that her mum also had the condition and had obviously been probably been told the same thing and, and or, you know, been persecuted for it. So that she, she had, you know, that was why she had said that to her own daughter. Um, but having found that this is genetic and runs in families, um, they are now looking um, and trying to, they're trying to identify it earlier enough, early enough so that they can train these children to figure out um, other ways of uh, finding their way around the, their environment. And they, they, you know, it's that idea that you can push these problems one way or the other, if you, especially if you catch them early enough. Um, and that, you know, the brain is capable of, of using yes. other areas oh. to do similar functions if you can sort of train it to do that. And Sharon had her own <clears throat> development way of how she dealt with this by yeah. turning herself around in a, in a world. Maybe that could be a, something that others could find out about without having to discover it themselves. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy because um, I, I, every now and then I get an email from somebody who has the same condition as Sharon mm. and they always say that they use the same technique which I've spoken to the researcher about since and I said you know why do, why does this work they spin themselves around and suddenly their world writes itself and they can find their way around again and then you know maybe a few minutes later an hour later a day later it flips and it looks unfamiliar again mm. but they all seem to use the same spinning technique, and they've all come across it independently that this spinning technique works. So it's just one of those weird anomalies, mysteries of the brain that we really don't understand, but um, it does seem seems a common theme. The next time you get lost, <laughs> give this a little try and see if suddenly everything makes sense again. Probably not. I think we're all interested in terms of the ability to try to communicate science in an interesting way. We're the National Institutes of Health. We're the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. Uh, we're doing all these amazing things now from basic science up through clinical medicine at a time where things are happening so fast and it's so exciting. And yet, most of the time, I don't think we get that message across uh, to the public in the way that we wish we could. 
a book like yours is capable of bringing people into this kind of interesting place of marveling at the brain and at the science that's beginning to make sense of it. Um, how do you think we could do a better job in terms of scientific communication, not just about neuroscience, but about everything else that we're doing? What's your observation from where you sit as a science journalist about how this whole transfer of information is working or not? Mm. I mean, the thing that I can offer, I guess, as a science journalist is uh, I was taught from, a, from the first day I was at New Scientist that there were three things to think about when you wanted to know whether it was a story worth telling, whether this research was something that people wanted to know about. And I think maybe thinking about it from that point of view would help that, and these three things were, um, it, is, it, is it new? What, like, what's, what's new about this? What, what, um, how is it push, you know, how's it pushing this, this, what we know in the world on forward? Um, the second thing was, is it relevant? How is this relevant to me as a person living in the world? Or you know, how is it relevant to this other person or this community or this country? Um, and the third thing uh, was, do I want to tell my friends down the pub about it? And I think that's actually the one that I use the most. Um, still to this day, every single research paper I read, I, I ask myself those three questions. And, um, and maybe it's, it's about thinking about those three things and how your research can fit those or tick at least one of those boxes. And you know, if it does, I think that makes it research that people will want to know about. And, um, and it's kind of thinking about how you can get, you can translate what you're doing into something that people can tell their friends down the pub about. Um. Yeah, I think in this country, there's certainly been a lot of pressure uh, of an unfortunate sort on science journalism, a lot of science writing, uh, particularly for some of the larger, most visible outlets uh, has gotten shrunk. <clears throat> Nobody would think of cutting out the sports reporting <laughs> in the newspaper, but science reporting, mm -hmm. maybe not considered to be quite so critical. Yeah. And so the number of science reporters who are in a really good position uh, to be able to tell those kinds of stories that you'd want to share in the pub is yeah. shrinking. Is that true in the UK as well? Yeah, I think <clears throat> so. Um, yeah, I mean, all of journalism is in a real, is, is in a bit of a bind at the moment <clears throat> because there is no, there's not a lot of advertising. Nobody's really created, in the UK at least, an advertising model that works for journalism. And obviously, it's so easy to be, to write anything you want online now and to have millions of people read it, um, regardless of whether it's, it's fake news or not. So, um, yeah, it's certainly a problem. I think it is a, as far as I, I've heard from various sources that there are major um, organizations from the main news sources getting together at the moment who are trying to basically come to a, a, an agreement of this is how we're all going to um, model mm -hmm. our businesses um, and trying to work out a way that we can translate to people whether something is reliable. I know Google is working on ways to um, be able to make it transparent as to whether a news some, a link that you click on is um, mm. is is a reliable source or not. Um, they're using various very clever ways of um, working out whether that author, that writer has written about that subject before. Um, for what organisations have they written about that subject before? You know, so using these little uh, ways in which to confirm whether that's that's a reliable source. I think that's a really interesting um, development that hopefully will help. Uh, well, as you bring that up, of course, we're all thinking about vaccines right now, because here in the US, we just crossed 1,000 cases of measles uh, this year for an entirely preventable disease mm. uh, coming about because of a lot of false information about the safety of the vaccines, which are incredibly safe, mm -hmm. but yet are still being promoted based on inaccurate information as potentially dangerous. And a lot of people do get their information uh, from doing an internet search and landing on the first thing that pops up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think, is causing a lot of concern, not just about vaccines, but many other areas of science information. And I would think science journalists probably have a pretty big stake in trying to be sure that the information you're putting out there really is getting to the people <coughs> who are looking for things that are accurate and not being derailed uh, mm. by a lot of other mm. forces which are not necessarily based on evidence or rationality. Mm. Is that a big discussion that science journalists have when you get together in terms of how to try yeah. to get the right stuff out there? Well, it's hard, isn't it? It's, 
it's because we'd all love to write stories that have the in-depth reporting behind them, that we talk to all of the different parties involved, that we can talk to all the researchers that want to speak to us about this subject. And unfortunately, in, in this world of instant, gen, instant news, that often we're under pressure to comment on a story or produce a story within an hour, and it's, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, again, comes back to this model, um, the, 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 the financial model, economic model behind journalism at the moment that was just not working because nobody's making any money from, from it and they're making money from clicks and they want you know, a million clicks on a story and you're not necessarily going to get that on the important <laughs> stories that really do matter. You're going to get it on the, you know, the, the uh, Brad Pitt's having face blindness kind of stories, you know. So, For example. Um, yeah, it is a broken model at the moment and hopefully it will be, it will be fixed at some point in, in the near future. So we've been talking particularly about your book and about your interest and your wonderful way of writing about the brain, but I know from looking at your bio that you are interested in other areas of science as well. What are you most excited about right now in terms of things that you're writing about or maybe even thinking about another book? Um, so <coughs> it did cross my mind that maybe I should expand this out to communities with extraordinary conditions or traits, um, not just the brain but the body. Um, I'd come across actually somebody who I, who I would love to have put in the book. Um, it was the third uh, one that didn't work out was a community of people in the Cape Mountains in South, Af South Africa um, who have, uh, because of a lot of kind of inbreeding, um, they have a condition which destroys their amyg amygdala and it, um, allow it stops them being able to feel fear as well as a few other emotions. And um, wow. I mean, mm -hmm. that was interesting enough, but then I heard from the one researcher who was able to go and study this community that one of the most intriguing things about these people is not their inability to feel fear, but their inability to tell lies. And it mm -hmm. makes sense when you think about it, because if you think why you tell a lie, it's because you're fearful of the consequences of telling the truth. And if you can't feel fear, then you have no reason to tell lies. And I just felt that that was... <laughs> like, what, what is it like to have to live in a village where nobody tells, li tells lies, you know? Um, and that would never work in Washington. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'd, and I'd, I, wanted, I wanted to go and visit this, this family and, and, well, this community, um, and it was just not possible. It was, you know, in the middle of nowhere, um, this tiny little village mining diamonds, and they spoke Dutch Afrikaans. I would have had to get translators we it was very it was very very difficult to get there physically um but i would love to if i had enough time be able to make that happen um and then that kind of set me on the idea of okay well what other communities are out there and we i mean i'm sure you know about the there's a community in colombia where uh, they all have a lot of them have early onset alzheimer's the genetic yes. predisposition for that and they're providing amazing um mm patient group for testing early treatments for Alzheimer's. Yeah, we fund them. That's yeah. a very <laughs> famous enterprise and one that we have high hopes for yeah. as maybe the way in which we'll finally figure out how to prevent this disease. Exactly. And, and it's and a powerful story. It's <laughs> exactly. And the story behind those people and those families who have that. Um, and then there's a community in Greek, well, there's a few Greek islands where the populations um, are, they, there's an extraordinary number of people who live over 100, to be over 100, and obviously we all want to know <laughs> what their secret is. Um, and yeah, so I just I started coming across communities uh, of people who have these kind of traits or interesting things about them, and um, uh, like an interesting community to study. So perhaps there's a, there's, that's maybe the next step. <laughs> Might be another book in there somewhere. Yeah, maybe. And other things outside of neuroscience, I think I saw you have written about things like sequencing of uh, genomes in babies, am I right? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> um, I, yeah, well, there's lo lots of different areas. I've, I'm, I'm quite interested at the moment, perhaps it's um, probably all new parents have this, but I've become very aware of sustainability and the amount of one single-use plastics and that, and I don't know what it's like in the US at the moment, but in the UK, it's a very, very big deal. Um, seems to be a real big mindset change in terms of what people are using and producing and how we're, how we're um, living our lives in terms of what we're throwing away. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I, I'm finding that really interesting at the moment and what's, what we can do as individuals to um, what we're contributing to that and how we're affecting our environment and sustainability and, and what new technologies are around and what we can do as individuals to, um, in that sort of sphere. Um, so I'm, that's kind of new for me to look into sustainability and, and, and environmental topics, but I'm finding that really interesting at the moment, um, probably because of the amount of nappies that I'm throwing in a bin at the moment. <laughs> but, um, What's been the overall reception to your book? Um, it, you've probably heard from lots of readers or been to book signings and gotten feedback. Uh, what's that been like? Yeah, no, it's lovely. It's, um, you, when you're writing a book, you never kind of think about the people who actually that anyone's ever going to read it at the end of it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still surprised every time I get an email from somebody who's read the book. Um, I'm very flattered. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been really great. I have only I meant to say actually at the beginning that some. I'm very conscious of the way that I describe the people in the book um, as perhaps I use the word strange and extraordinary and weird or odd and all these words that are quite sensitive and um, I, I wanted to kind of make clear because sometimes I get comments after talks that um, these are the words that the people themselves used and I decided that in the book I know that you know neurodiverse atypical these are the words that you know we should use but I actually found that I was going to I was doing a disservice to the people in the book to call their can, to call their experiences atypical because that's not how they describe them to me. They mm. describe, you know, they would say it's not atypical. It's really weird, you know, it's really weird. Um, and I know, I've, you know, the only the reaction, the only negative reaction I've ever got about talking about my book is from people who have found that have found that offensive to call because they have perhaps suffered from these conditions uh, in some way themselves and, and they found it. Uh, difficult to hear somebody describe their brain as weird um, and so it is something that I wanted to make clear you know when I do these talks after that um, I, I made sure that I said you know this was this is how these people described their own conditions and that's why I chose to use those that kind of language but um, huh. yeah other than that I think the um, the, re the response has always been really positive so a related question from somebody in the book club was that it seemed like a theme that resonated with many of these individuals was that they had worked pretty hard to hide their condition mm. from other people because of fear that they'd be thought of as mentally ill or in other ways mm. discriminated against. And yet you asked them to like open up <laughs> uh, to you and indirectly to all these people yeah. who are going to read about them. Was that a bit of a discussion that you had to get them yeah. past their resistance to being disclosing? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it should be the biggest challenge, but it, it really wasn't. It was um, ev almost, I, everybody but the, the person I described earlier with the, the not, one, not feeling that his legs were part of his own body. Mm -hmm. um, everybody was really enthusiastic about talking, and I think it's because they didn't, they'd never get, got, gotten the chance to talk about their condition and, before, and they wanted people to know about it, and they were really excited about letting people um, know about their brain, and they were, and, and they were really proud of it you know Sharon who had suffered for many many decades of hiding it and feeling very severely depressed over it now she knew what was wrong with her now she knew what the, the reason was behind it she was so proud of who she has this picture of Wonder Woman because of the spinning round technique um, you know on her fridge and she tells everybody she can about it so actually and they and they felt that the more information that was out there on these conditions you know other people wouldn't have to hide like they had uh, you know they, they felt this kind of obligation to others out there um, and and that has actually been the case I've had email you know I get an elite you know a few emails every week from people who have said I never knew that this was what I had until I read the same you know Joe I, I had I had one um, really poignant email that I sort of always bring up in my talks about this um, in which a woman emailed me she was in her 40s and she said I have spent my entire life almost ent entirely alone because I could never understand how anybody could be around any other person because I feel everything that they feel. I feel every touch on my body, every emotion that they feel, it, 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 I feel in my own body. Um, I could never separate my own emotions from theirs. Uh, and, and it was just, too, it was too much for her. And she said, yeah, she said she, she'd spent most of her life alone because that's the only way that she could handle um, experiencing everybody, el what everybody else was experiencing. And, and if you compare that to the last chapter in the book, Joel, Joel who is yeah. obviously you know highly intelligent, he's a neurologist. He uses his this what he would call an ability to uh, empathise with his patients, to really get in touch with them. Uh, he'd learnt to control it so that it didn't um, overwhelm him. 
And, you know, he, he, he didn't take any drugs. He didn't have access to any fancy treatments that this woman, ha you know, didn't have access to. The only difference between them was that Joel talked about his brain. He found, he, he, you know, he, he told the world, he told his friends, he told doctors, he spoke about his perceptions of the world and how they differed to other people's. Um, he, he, learned, he learned about his brain, he understood it, and then he um, embraced it. And his well-being was so different in such mm. a stark contrast, even though it wasn't like he had some magic pill that this woman didn't, you know, didn't have. It, it was only about speaking about it that, mm. that the difference was. Um, and, and so I, I find that actually, that's what, that's what I got out of, out of meeting all these people was the importance of, of talking about our perceptions of the world and um, understanding that what we see and what we feel and what we experience can be completely different to, to the person sitting next to us. Uh, next to us. Um, that's and fascinating. Yeah, in terms of that uh, particular description, um, the way in which somebody's life must exist is hard to imagine and that you actually can feel the touch of somebody else by watching them being touched and yet to turn that into something well of course it didn't hurt that he became a neurologist mm. to completely embrace the mm. opportunity to learn uh, from that that's for sure i'm curious because you wrote rather intimately about these people did you let them read your draft mm. so that they could see how they were yeah. described and were yeah i mean that okay was part that? of you know, I would always have done that. I do that with my journalism as well, but I, um, I let them, they were part of the, the whole process. I saw, they saw drafts before they went anywhere near to an editor. You know, they saw the final draft. They saw everything before it was published, you know, because I, I don't want to print anything that they weren't happy with. And, um, you know, it was their story that I was telling. It was a yeah. very privileged position to be in. So um, I, and, you know, like, I think, you know, uh, uh, Ruben, who, has this um, synesthesia where he sees colors depending on the emotion that he feels towards somebody. Even he, though he's colorblind. Even which... though he's colorblind, so he's a colorblind synesthete. Um, and he said that, you know, he carries my chapter around with him because he finds, he's always found it really difficult to describe what he has to people um, without sounding like an idiot, he says, you know. He's like, if I tell people I can see auras, they think I'm, you know, a mind reader or, you know, a mystic or, um, and he, so he was really grateful because he had this, you know, now condensed version of what, what his, um, his condition is or his trait. And so um, that was really nice to be able to actually just summarize someone's life for them so that they can just pass it on to, Here, to whoever this. they need yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are drawing near the end of the hour. I want to ask you uh, for advice uh, for us. This Big Read program, which we're now having a wonderful third year experience, we'll need to have a fourth year experience. When you sort of look across what's happening right now in terms of people who are writing books that are conveying messages about science, it's a pretty good, rich arena, but do you have any recommendations for us about where we might think of going next year? Um, yeah, I was saying <clears throat> to somebody earlier that my book, uh, my reading library at the moment is mostly the hungry caterpillar and the gruffalo and things. So <laughs> I'm probably not the best person well, to be up to date. But <laughs> it's probably not the book you're looking for. <laughs> um, no, but I did review uh, Carl Zimmer's new book, which is uh, mm -hmm. she she's, has her mother's laugh. Um, I think it's called She Has Her Mother's Laugh. Um, and that is all about inheritance and yes. how our definition of inheritance is changing with our new technologies, so gene editing technology, mm -hmm. um, and also what we know about epigenetics and um, how we can pass on acquired traits as well. And I think that's just a really fascinating area, and it's really relevant right now given you know what we're seeing with gene editing technology. So I, I, I love that book, and it was very eloquently written, obviously, as all of his, his stuff is. Um, so yeah. OK, I, that sounds I like a that. good recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, uh, Helen, as, as we're winding up, if you wouldn't mind just reading uh, from your book uh, the very sort of last paragraph uh, of your conclusion, because I thought it was a lo lovely summary and, and beautifully written about what we all might take away from a book of this sort. So it's that last paragraph. I didn't warn her I was going to do this except <laughs> at the last Don't minute. So me. it's a good thing I brought the book. <laughs> we all possess a remarkable feat of neural engineering that gives us intense feelings of love, that makes others laugh, that produces an unpredictable life that is utterly unique. 
It gives us the ability to remember an infinite amount of knowledge, to create an idea that has never been considered, to find an answer in the beating of our hearts. Our brain is a mystery that has not yet revealed the extent of the unimaginable lands it is capable of producing. And when it does, I think that will be the most romantic story of all. Wonderful. That's beautiful. So, Helen, it's been wonderful to have this opportunity uh, to have you as our guest uh, for this year's Big Read. There will be a reception in the FAES Terrace up here, take a right, and uh, there will be book signing uh, opportunities there uh, with our author and other chances perhaps for you to talk uh, with her. I want to thank all of you for coming and for listening by video, and I particularly want to thank the staff that have organized this and the people who ran the book clubs to get us ready for this very special day. And let us once again please express our thanks uh, to our author, Helen Thompson. Thank you.